presentation this morning is on my mother, Franziska Berzon Polacek, who lived from 1912 to 1999, and um, the title is Earth Mystic as Painter. And in this time together, I'm hoping Jeremiah and I can give some sense of, uh, of uh, this, what I think was a very amazing human being, and we all love our mothers, I would hope, but it is a real pleasure for me to be a actually able to spend time honoring this amazing human being. And she would have loved those readings that Arnie read this morning about matter and evolution. And as a matter of fact, she liked Arnie very much uh, as, a, as an artist and as a person and was very interested in And she would very often ask, is he still painting and things like that. So I said, well, I don't know. But... Uh, <clears throat> but um, what we'll do this morning is I have some things I want to say, some themes. We'll look at some of the paintings here. And then I'd like us to go in the back room and we'll go as a, as a little tour and, and go in there and uh, look at some of those, come back in here and discuss. And um, throughout the, the time, Jeremiah will have things to say about individual paintings and, and the like. Uh, let me introduce, not everybody knows, necessarily knows Jeremiah, but I'll introduce you again. Um, Jeremiah. Um, hello. Okay. Yeah, there you are. <laughs> right, very good, great, good. Uh, just completed his uh, Bachelor of Fine Arts at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago and takes art very seriously and, and does a lot of painting in his own work and uh, has his own stories about how Francisca may have in influenced you and I'm anxious to find out what you're going to have to say today. Um, do, you ha do you have any comments you want to make right at the beginning just to get us going and then I'll talk about, I have some things about these paintings. and. Um, you can start. Okay, okay, I'll okay, all right. Okay. Well, one of my tasks then today is to, I think, to try to get a sense of this life of this human being who lived for 87 years in a rural community, farming community of Kansas, and who was very deeply connected to her community. She was respected, she was known as a member of her community. But she was also a person who had her own unique vision and her own unique a life and was a found a way to share that to be creative and to be expressive in a community and to share that with a community that responded and so part of my job I think is to even find the words to show how in a way she became a role model for me as I try to live in a community and be a person of integrity and to a person with my own unique way of doing things and yet to be totally engaged with other human beings in a in a small in small community but I, as we look at this little group of paintings up here i did i wanted to say that i thought there were four there were four themes that contributed to her becoming what i would call an earth mystic who was able to express that through painting so the first thing is, uh, my first theme is that she lived her entire life in Republic County, Kansas. And she was a, she lived on a, in an area where there's a little, there's a creek called Rose Creek. It was a small creek that ran, th runs, <laughs> ran through our farm. It still runs through our farm. The creek just keeps on going. Uh, <clears throat> uh, runs through our farm in Kansas. And she knew that community backward and forward. She knew the uh, ecosystem, the birds, the animals, the plants. She saw it evolve over a period of time. But she was deeply engaged in that place, Rose Creek. And so that painting back there, the large painting, is called Dry Creek. <clears throat> and I think it's a, it's a strong painting of hers. And it's important as part of this vision that that in that, at that point, that creek is dry. So at the same time, we'll be exploring that theme today of life, death, uh, fertility, fecundity, and decay and destruction, which is just such a basic theme for her. So here we have a creek that should have water in it, but it is a dry creek. So there's that sense of being, uh, doing, experiencing both of those things at the same time. And... Um, that, so that painting raises the theme, first of all, of, of living in a place and knowing it so well. Very often we would say things to her like, uh, why don't you uh, go, uh, why don't you come and visit us in North Dakota or a, a cousin of ours uh, 
who lives in San Francisco today. You probably know the Polachek uh, gift uh, company and everything, and he by the red, uh, Redwoods and all those. And they'd say, why don't you come and visit? And she would say, I don't want to leave. I might miss something on Rose Creek. Now, it was meant, it's meant ironically, she's a very clever, intelligent person, but she also meant it that I do want to hear when those birds return, or I, I want to watch the colors change at a certain time of the year. I don't want to miss what is happening here at this particular moment. She, so she meant it, but she also was sophisticated enough to know that it was an ironic statement to some degree. All of these paintings in, on, on this wall in some way touch on that theme of life, death, birth, fecundity, destruction in, in some form, and we'll come back and, and, and touch on that. The second theme that I want to raise is living in a farming rural community. Uh, this is a person who knew that world of a of a Midwestern or you might say Great Plains farming community backward and forward and you know fed uh, threshers in the 1930s and uh, watched farms develop in their in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s uh, saw the dying of communities, the deterioration of r rural America. She experienced that in her being. She found ways to paint it and uh, ex use paint and painting as a way of exploring that. And I have some anecdotes after we go on our tour that I want to share when we come back that uh, express how deeply connected she was to the world of the plants and the farmers and the animals and raising gardens and all that kind of thing. The third theme that I want to bring up is the theme of evolution. Our family was a very pro-Charles Darwin family. And uh, the idea that we are connected to other animals was very important in our household, especially from her message as a sort of a priestess, prophetess, painter. <clears throat> we heard over and over these ideas that we're connected to animals and that evolution, the idea of evolution is a really good thing and that, our, that, our, that we're physical beings and uh, uh, that the fact that we are connected to animals is, a, is something to celebrate and it's exciting. It's also kind of a challenge. But uh, so we were always, uh, we were, uh, she was constantly doing things relating to the evolution of, of life. And that also meant that because we were a pro-Darwinian family and a very pro-evolution family, we were also, and she was very, sus uh, very uh, suspicious of Christianity and had no, very little respect for organized religion of any kind. And... Um, uh, but that would create a tension, that would create a tension in her community, because there would be so many people in the community who would be fundamentalists and things like that, but they knew that, that Francisca was a pro-Darwinian, and she painted it, and she was, well, she was trying to express the processes of life and evolution in her, in her work, actually. And then the fourth thing I want to just bring up, and that had a big influence, I think, on her ability to be an earth mystic, was the world of art, particularly what that... In the 50s, when she started painting, and, and when she was in her 40s, and the first painting she did were paintings of Rose Crick, big, beautiful, very nice, uh, large paintings of Rose Crick, and uh, and that was important in itself because not there was not one artist in our community at that time, and there weren't like that many artists, but there were people who experimented with painting, who would paint their own local community. If they were interested in painting a nature scene, it would be a mountain, for example. You can imagine this kind of thing. She was the only person who actually said, I will paint, I will go out to the Rose Creek with my pad, and I would, some, she would try some easel things out there and draw looking at a, at a, let's say a tree like this, which is on that, on our farm, is in the Rose Creek area. And uh, so here is this tree that was destroyed by a tornado, probably several, uh, 30 years ago now. And there she's out there working with that particular tree. That was very unusual in that community. And people knew that she, would, that she was painting their own community, their own lives. And that had an impact on, 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 uh, on people. Uh, it was also her way of explore, uh, respecting her community, but also challenging it and even doing things that were, would be controversial. But also, it was in the 50s and 60s that what we call abstract expressionism is really strong, where people are able to make a painting with unfamiliar shapes or where you're creating your own shapes and where you're not representing, let's say, a horse or a cow or a, or a, a barn or something like that. 
But that gave her the freedom to really use paint to explore her deepest vision of natural forces. So an interesting thing, if you take, uh, let's say, here we have a broken down tree that's ruined by the storm or torn apart by the storm. And then she goes and takes a, a chunk of that tree here and she's looking at it, looking at that broken, torn thing that is decomposing and turning into soil. And so is it, in some ways, she's, it's a realistic painting of a, a piece of a broken uh, log. Uh, but at the same time, she's out, it's, it, because of abstract expressionism, which meaning I can look at a painting with no recognizable shapes and forms, I can now uh, look at that as a, as, a, as a work of art in itself. My little theory, and I, I spent a lot of time thinking about her because she's had such an important influence on my life. My, my thought is that abstract expressionism gave her the permission to look deeply, deeply at the physical world. To look at a, at a she would mention, and, she, and there was this mystical side. She would have loved Steve Merrill as, because of your work as a soil scientist and to talk with you about that. For example, I remember her saying that when she would look at a clump of soil, she said, it just takes my breath away at what I see there. And that was an expression of a mysticism of looking at soil and, and, and having a sense of death, life, fertility, things coming forth. And it was a very important part of her message. And e each of these paintings in some ways touches on that. So by the time you get over here, she can create her own forms and it looks kind of like an, it would be an abstract piece, but at the same time it looks like it's organic and she's working, and maybe it's under the sea or something like that, but she's creating her own organic world and she called that earth music and several of her paintings then were referred to as earth music. This painting is another attempt to deal with that same subject. She was very interested in the, the goddess of the earth, Erda, from which we get the word Earth. And so being able to draw on mythologies and know it's a mythology and say, I'm going to uh, create something that relates to the emergence of life. And uh, so there she is. I mean, in a way, all of these paintings, I think, touch on a kind of earth mysticism, whether it's abstracted or it's a realistic painting of your own dry crick. Comments, doctor? <laughs> um, I guess one thing I think that's kind of funny is that they're in a church to begin with. Like, <laughs> this, oh, well, I don't know if this counts as a church. But. I know. Yeah. <laughs> but um, Francisca would sometimes call me on Sundays and ask for my dad. And I'd be like, oh, he's at church. And she'd be like, what the hell is he doing there? <laughs> like, so, <laughs> but, uh, it was a problem. Yeah. <laughs> so, but um, but I, one thing I think is that carries on with a lot of her work is the fact that they are a lot of them are kind of have an irony to them. And uh, one story I remember is that I don't know if it was she had a nude that was hanging in a, a church in where was it probably Munden, Kansas, probably probably Munden, Kansas or something. And somebody objected to the nudity in it, so um, and she like, refused to take it down, but instead put a cloth over it. Mm -hmm. So. Everybody would be more curious to come, to come and look at it. <laughs> so, but um, yeah. And uh, like another story I had that I was going to say yes. was that, uh, and you can help out if I screw it up. I'll make it up. Yes. But um, she had this huge mirror in uh, the dining room that was like what, like eight feet wide or so, and. Um, Somebody, I think probably my dad or somebody was like, why do you have this huge mirror, you know, in your dining room? And it was opposite the picture window, picture window in there. And she said, I wanted, I want to let the, what's outside inside. Yes. And I like how that, and that idea of that frame being around a mirror and a frame being around a painting and looking at things as if they are a mirror of what is outside. Mm -hmm. And, um, I think another thing that's pretty extraordinary about her is that she didn't look at um, artists. She may have seen, uh, like, Jackson Pollock in Life. I guess he was in Life in the late 50s. But um, she wasn't somebody who was watching the art world and keeping up with it and how everything's evolving and everything. It was more her own personal pursuit and um, endeavors. And she came up with these paintings that fit an actual, from my 
whatever uh, school view. They actually fit a, a period in art history too, which is um, abstract expressionism, especially a woman doing abstract expressionism. And um, she probably wouldn't consider herself a feminist. Probably not. We'll discuss that. Because she would probably be scared of too many people holding the same dogma. But, mm. like, yeah, well, that's what, yeah. <laughs> but um, the idea that she was able to, like, do essentially kind of feminist or whatever you would call it type of work mm -hmm. involving, like, nude women. And um, there's one painting that's not here that is, um, I don't know what it's called, but it's like this creation painting where there's all these uh, women and they're all holding babies and they're crawling out of like the mud but they look like monsters and they're just all like full of blood and um, they all have these like little babies that they're holding and it's like some sort of apocalyptic scene even though it's supposed to be like millions of years ago but mm -hmm. anyway you can go back I hadn't that. remembered that well, I love that, that phrase <laughs> about she was so able to come up with these sort of Zen-like one-liners, uh, like this thing about why do you have this mirror, and then that answer, I want to let the outside in. It was just wow, what an interesting thought I thought that was, and 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 it had I, I hadn't thought of that for for some time. Uh, I'm thinking that uh, maybe you know the time as it passes, uh, rather than going in the back, um, maybe we do have a large group here. We would uh, maybe we won't go in the back, and I invite you to look at those those pieces. Uh, later, <clears throat> that are in fact we could have, um, I suppose, brought them, but uh, they'll they'll be here for one month. I, I, they'll be here for a month. Uh, let's not go in the back just because there are so many people and time is passing anyhow. And then we can we're almost at a sort of discussion point anyhow. Um, I did want to mention some of the the paintings in the back. There's a painting of a woman, a milk a young woman milking a cow, and uh, some of you saw that. And I, when, I'd like you to go eventually and look at that because it, here is this uh, young woman with I think was she wearing a pink dress? I can't remember. And a reddish a yeah. reddish dress, and this milk is squirting out, and they're in the, there's this cow that's looking right at us, and there's this kind of a pole shed, and um, you look at that, and it is a it's a very harsh painting. It's not at all a sentimentalization or nostalgia. It's uh, rather the the, ground, the soil is what we would say beat to hell. It's it's just beat down and hard and it's packed. And uh, she had this ability. I would like you to look at some of those eventually. It's a theme that I you know she and I would talk about this of depicting Earth as something that's extremely fecund or fertile and rich, but also something that's just dry and beaten and hard. And you'll see that in some of those in, in some of those is back there. And it was again this w this desire to live with the, the the total spectrum of things. And that's one of the reasons Dry Crick I think takes on a certain quality that she's primarily interested in the way that soil is up there and and uh, and, and drying out, even though it should be a crick. And I just want to use another example of a one of the I don't this one wasn't even framed. She probably wasn't satisfied with this, but as an as an example, she calls this naked earth, and um, she's probably referring to our Rose Creek area here, and she's creating her own little world, and, but there, it's dark and gloomy, but it is kind of wet. You know, there's water down here, and uh, I remember talking with her about the fact that as you look at this strange painting, she's, again, she's using, I think, paint and painting as a way of exploring these the deepest things that I think people in a community can discover about their lives in community with other people, family, friends, uh, nature, the body. And if you look in here, you'll see there's a shape in here that's like a, a crocodile starting to emerge. You can see just, can you see a little bit? There are these leg things so that as she's exploring this kind of an ugly looking painting, uh, even though I do kind of, I like it more all the time. Uh, and the greens and the wetness. There is there is something. Life is emerging here in the form of like reptiles, dinosaurs, crocodiles. Can you see that little kind of alligator in there? So there's this little bit of a, a leg in here. So she was. So even a painting like this, she's she's exploring that subject of life, evolution. Where do forms come from? How do our bodies relate to that? There's the yeah. big painting too. 
I'll bring that out later just to that's show. That's big grand finale. Well, that's a, it's a, it's a, I want to tell two stories that relate to her life in community as a part and experiencing the farm world in such an intense way, in such a physical world, <clears throat> a physical way. Let me make sure I get my two stories straight. Uh, okay, the first one is, uh, this, uh, this is a lesson in the history of rural America, and Don and I have been having some very interesting conversation of where this is, and she was an expert in thinking about the evolution of rural America and, uh, and uh, watching it change and like, and I remember uh, a few years ago, we were talking about her childhood. And I, maybe I've told this story before, but it's one of my favorite stories in the whole wide world. And um, she said how they were, her family was one of the last to have an automobile. And they would, they would take their horse and buggy into Belleville, Kansas, once a week. And uh, probably, let's say, in 1916, 1920. And again, you can say that really stretches it back. And I said, well, why did you go into town? Did you, were you shopping for groceries? He says, well, of course not. <laughs> maybe, maybe we'd be getting coffee, maybe sugar and exotic fruits like bananas and oranges. But everything else on this farm was raised by that family. And I just find this so compelling and so interesting because it wasn't something that happened 500 years ago. We're talking, she lived this in her own life and then she started listening. When it came to meats, let's say our menu is going to start with meat. I'm sorry, but it will this time. So there was... Pork, beef, they had sheep, chickens, and ducks, because it was a Czech family, ducks and geese, too. They raised their own, I said, well, what about flour? You didn't grind your own flour. Well, as a matter of fact, they did. They, <laughs> they raised their own wheat, oats, corn, and they ground their own flour, and they ground their own corn into cornmeal, and like they had the milk, and they made their own butter, and uh, they always had a garden. And because, again, it was a Czech family, and I, this was something throughout her entire life, um, there was always an herb garden. So there we, we lived with chamomile and poppies and poppy seed and, and uh, a, a various, a various, dill would be an important thing. But there was always a garden with all those vegetables. And uh, so this was a family in her own life that, that experienced all those foods that they made themselves. So uh, I would say, even though we don't see any food paintings here, that's part of the vision here. This being so bound up with the physical world and plants and, and animals and raising your own food and that it affects the way, her way of seeing the world. And it's part of her, I would say, her mysticism. Another story I want to tell that I think is very tell something about the way of, of living in a community and then finding a way to be able to articulate it. Um, it ha relates, let's take the subject of women and women's spirituality. Many of you know uh, uh, Louise Pere, for example, a woman who is, used to work here at the Unitarian Church and just finished a PhD in women's spirituality at, in a school in San Francisco. And <clears throat> one day Louise and I were talking about contemporary women's use of menstruation as a, as a uh, spiritual ritual, for example, and how it's a struggle and how, do you, how, do, how does one affirm the body and, and blood and, 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 and the like. And uh, so she was, say, Louise shared, and I think she probably said this to here too, that she had this practice so it, uh, when she was menstruating, she would gather that blood and then she would uh, put it, and then she would rinse out those cloths and put it in her plants to raise, you know, in her potted plants, so that the, it's not just thrown away and discarded, but it's treated with respect. And so I was talking with my mother about this <clears throat> a few years ago, and about what do you think of that? And she said, oh, she said we did that all the time. My <laughs> gosh, <laughs> she said, you know, and that was the practice in that family. That uh, that I mean, it's probably maybe some of your experience, but it was such an important part of it that there were seven women in my mother's family with the mother and the daughters, and they would, w during their month monthly cycles, they would gather that blood in cloths, that they called rags, and uh, put it in a bucket, a special bucket, rinse it out, and then consciously poured that water on the garden with the idea that this would be good for the garden. So as part of my sort of theme, too, that along with living in a place so intensely, being part of a farm community, uh, the theory of evolution, and then painting allowed this person to explore life in such an interesting and powerful 
way and, and to reflect on her own experience and share this with other people in the community who knew she was doing it and they would learn and then she was respected I I love to see people coming to her shows or people coming into the house and talking with her farmers ranchers and looking at her latest paintings and discussing wh whether it's an abstract piece or a, or a or a, a bunch of bins or something like that any other comments maybe if you have any comments or questions go ahead now I have a question. Yeah, okay because you said that she started in her 40s. Mm -hmm. What about her earlier life? Did some, what made her suddenly start to paint? Did she suddenly, or had she been painting, or did this develop over? Because mm -hmm. 40 seems like uh, later in life to suddenly start producing all these gorgeous mm -hmm. paintings. What was kind of, what led up to that? I think her version of the story, and, and people would ask her this, First of all, she was having children. It was one of those typical stories where, uh, an important thing, she did not go beyond eighth grade. In, in that family, no, nobody went higher than eighth grade. And uh, so, uh, uh, you know, she was working, and, but she was always uh, studying. She, she, she would, she would, there was drawing. Uh, I don't think... But there, the family was also pretty supportive of yes, the arts think, in general. Like, I think, didn't she want to be a... Tight walk roper when uh, she was growing up. There was up always this exotic. She was like, an excellent pianist. I mean, I, one of the reasons I like sharing this with people too is if, I mean, I know all of you or most of you, and uh, you, one of the things you know me as is a pianist. My main piano teacher was Francesca. I took some piano in college, but she was my teacher, uh, you know, strong, confident, aggressive, bold pianist, and you know, uh, so she, and she would write music, for example. She tried and she would play. Um, she was always studying, but there was something that gave her the permission. I think it's partly the fact that she was not a conventional church person, for instance. She didn't have any of these forces saying, you can't do things, and you have a right to be a little strange. So in the 50s, when her children were a little older, and then in the 50s, my father and mother uh, remodeled their home and made this incredibly beautiful place that needed to have decorations. She made paintings and sculptures for that home. And... Art, do you want to comment on our house just a little bit and just that whole world and you were well, there? Uh, one thing that uh, really I, I noticed especially was the contrast between the house, which was modern and, and quite large and well-designed and beautiful, and then there was decay around the the uh, old tractors sitting by a shed that's falling down and, and you see this kind of contrast. One of the things that I was moved to do when I was down there was to make a film. And so I took a lot of Super 8 footage and then I put it together and I know some of you have seen it. It's called Brian's Song. And one of the paintings that's in it, and a lot of these paintings are in it, but one of them is hiding behind hmm. here Brian and uh, I hope you'll try I'll bring that up and try. <laughs> <laughs> but it was that kind of lushness, uh, all kinds of life around there, and still also death. Because mm -hmm. one of the things we witnessed was the pulling of a calf that was caught in the heifer, young young uh, uh, young cow, mm -hmm. and uh, was having trouble, and in the process, both died. Mm -hmm. the calf as well as the heifer. And that's part of the film too. And uh, my youngest son was there. And, uh, uh, Garth was there as well as Sarah. Mm -hmm. And they were both little kids at the time. But that, that the, the intrigue of these two children as they're watching this process of Brian's brother uh, trying to yank this, uh, mm -hmm. get this calf out of there and save the cow mm -hmm. and failing in both. You know, right. it was just uh, that kind of contrast right. was so strong in that environment. Right. And what I think is so wonderful for her is that she was able to find a way to live that life, know it, be deeply connected and find a way to be expressive and creative and respected and bold and all those things at the same time. And she would eat, like she would eat everything. That like the weeds that would grow around the house, she'd try them. Yes. And like, right. I remember I was down there. I was probably in ninth grade or something, and we we're with like the cousins or somebody, and they're the like, cousins. "Jeremiah, you smoking marijuana?" And yeah, that's uh, right. <laughs> and uh, I was like, "No." And my and my grandma's like, 
probably 75, and she's like, you know, I haven't tried that yet. <laughs> so, <laughs> but, of course, there's like hemp and stuff growing all around the farm. Yes. But We were the biggest hemp farm, I think, in the country, actually. Yeah. But <laughs> yes, go ahead, sorry. That's the whole story. Well, well but, but and, and there's another, fa- an example of, again, these sort of one-line wisdoms, but they, again, I think they just keep coming through, is, um, uh, let's take, let's say, uh, and let's say my mother, I was your, my mother, and I'm saying to you, uh, uh, you need to go out and take care of the garden. You know, then, and what would she say? Oh, um, yeah, she always we, said the un, she never called them weeds. She said, like, getting rid of unwanted plant life. Right. Yes. Yes. She didn't. Right. Yeah, she said, oh, would, or she would even, talk, like Jeremiah said, would you go out and go to the garden and remove the unwanted plant life? <laughs> now, the point, and, then she, and, and it's because she's, she's conscious there, this division of plants between the good and the bad is annoying. And, it's a, and she knows it has a reason because we have to raise wheat and we have to remove the, the, the Canadian, th- all these kinds of things. But she also knows it's a social decision and that it has inv- eventually social in people in the people and, and uh, the, uh, you know, the, the clean and the unclean and all this kind of thing. As another example of living life uh, with plants and animal, I want to show this one because I, it represents so much of... I guess it goes like, no, I guess it's like this. Is the way it goes? Okay. A hand uh, reaching for apricots. Now, again, this is an example that pluck, uh, gathering fruit is such a major thing in this person's life. Uh, and apricots, I think, are especially important to us. I think there's something about Czech people and apricots that's a real a connection there. But um, when she's doing something like this, she's obviously reflecting on her own life. And she was uh, a fruit picker. You know, when we would pick cherries, you know, I remember how she, we, we'd be picking cherries and uh, my cherries would still be going bonk, bonk in the, in the bucket because I've only got, and hers already is, you know, three-fourths full and I'm going bonk, bonk, you know. But um, she also knows that the image of a woman reaching for fruit is one of the images, central images in, in the spirituality of our society dealing with Adam and Eve and all the problems that creates and everything. So here she's saying, I'm reaching for that fruit. I do this in my normal life because we have to, we're going to make this into apricot jam or something like that. But another dimension to this story, and that's part of that life, a lived life, which I think is so wonderful, is that my father and mother met when my mother and her sister were called by my father's family saying, well, we have some apricots over here. Would you like to come and pick them? Maybe live about 10 miles away. And so they came over to pick the apricots, and that's where my father and mother met in this kind of situation. So all of those things would be something she would have been conscious of in the process of, of creating a, a piece like this. Uh, the frames were always a problem in our lives. We were going, we'd go to these sales, and we'd find frames, and... Yes, those are all her own frames. They're all kind of weird. They were bought at some farm sale, and then we had to... Uh, uh, I, because everything is about me, I did want to point out <coughs> one of my favorites, that uh, when, I, when I, she did this painting of... Well, she did paintings of all her children and grandchildren, which is, again, this affirming of her family and children, but it had always had this sense of life continuing... You know, when babies were born, that we're never just saying we're, it's, you know, cute kids are being born. It's more like, you know, sperms and eggs are meeting and life is going on. Which, but she did this of me and when, I, when I was 18, and there's me in my typical pose, but uh, on, on, our, on the balcony, on our ceiling, or on the roof. But um, it's important that the painting, the book that I'm reading is D.H. Lawrence's Sons and Lovers which adds this another dimension of our own relationship, which is very mysterious and continues to be a kind of a mysterious relationship. And She hadn't read D.H. Lawrence that one, but she knew what it was. And, and it was interesting when Salman Rushdie was in, having trouble because of Satanic Verses. She, made, she said, now, have you read Satanic Verses? And I said, I sure have. And she said, I want to read that. So I got her copy, and then she did one painting relating to the Satanic Verses. So... Uh, this is an amazing human being, actually. She definitely did not believe in what we would call gods. The idea that there was some figure m- pulling the strings behind the scene was just uh, totally unacceptable. And uh, I think as she progressed and she could see that uh, that she would not have used the word earth mystic because the word mystic sounds a little too religious. And uh, what, was her, what was her church? Oh, that we weren't... 
Oh, none, none. Our family was part of a, there's a tradition of Czech atheists. There's a, there's a lodge, you can find it north or south of Mandan, called the ZCBJ, which is a, is a, a lodge group of people who came from Czechoslovakia who were very opposed to church, Christianity, and Catholicism specifically, against the government and state, empires and kings and things like that. And... Uh, uh, military against militarism, things like that. That was very deeply part of our tradition, absolutely. And she she held on to that because she could see people falling away and joining the churches and becoming Methodists and things like that. And she was, ah, you know, you know. And, it, and so it, we had to hold firm on that, you know. So, but she found her own way, I think, through painting, to be a powerful spiritual leader in her own community. We were not outsiders. We went to, well, it's an important thing, and I'll just comment quickly because it's such an important role model. She would just hate to hear all that talk about the Kansas laws about you can't teach evolution in school. Oh, my, I mean, I sometimes think it's great that she's no longer living, that she'd even have to deal with that. Oh, she would hate that, you know, these laws. But uh, the important thing is our, she is deeply connected to her community. She is a highly respected person. You know that's what is so awesome. She she's not she's not allowing herself to be an outsider. She is part of the life of this community. As she's a wonderful cook, she's a great musician, a performer. People like her. They trust her. They know that she doesn't go steal their chickens and things like that. And uh, even though you know this famous story, when my, my grandmother was asked, uh, you know, what's your recipe for good chicken noodle soup? You know this. I have I told this story before. And my grandmother said, first steal an old hen. And that was, <laughs> but no, this, this, it's a lesson in don't allow yourself to be alienated or marginalized. Take the lead, be res use the power you've got to, and, and live your life. I think she thought I was getting too religious in a, in a conventional sense, yes. Because for her, churches were what you would call a crutch. That's right. And, because, and there was a sense in which you are kind of on your own in this world and you need to uh, face things and it's a struggle. Uh, yes. But I think that's partly because there was no, certainly she was part of her community, but there was no interest in going to a church where you would find some kind of support. Okay. I, I, think okay. I think we better, we better stop. We better, Thank uh, you, Jeremiah, for doing I this. Give Jeremiah a hand.